you've ever done any writing, you know that you have to take on two roles. There's the creator and there's the editor. And you can't really play both roles at once. And just writing things down, jotting down your ideas, you have to get the editor out of the way so you can do the creative stuff. And then you bring the editor in to do some organizing. And then the creator has to write again. And then the editor comes back and looks at what you've written. And when you're creating, you have to be willing to run with whatever comes up to see how far it goes. When you're the editor, you can be pretty vicious, slashing here, slashing there, learning to admit to yourself that certain ideas just don't work. They've got to go. And when you're meditating, you have to have the same two roles. And again, they have to alternate. We're trying to create a state of concentration here. In fact, all the factors of the path are created. You create right view, you create right resolve. You bring these things into being. That's what bhavana means. But then you also have to evaluate them. And this is where two qualities come in very important. One is mentioned under the teachings on right mindfulness, which is ardency. As John Lee points out, that in the context of right mindfulness, ardency is the wisdom factor, which is interesting because you sometimes hear that sampajanya is the wisdom factor. Alertness is the wisdom factor, but that's not the case. It's trying to do this well. This way, have to bring in wisdom. And it's in the doing it well, or learning how to do it well, that you have to develop your wisdom to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And that figuring out what works and doesn't work, that's the role of evaluation, which is the wisdom factor in right concentration. You stay with the breath for a while, and then you figure out, is it working well or not? If it's not working well, then you've got to figure out what will work better. And the more precise your powers of evaluation, the better the meditation gets. But both the ardency and the evaluation have to be built on the willingness to judge that something is not working and not get knocked over by that fact. To be a really reliable judge of things, you have to not let yourself get upset when things are not going well, because otherwise you start skewing the judgment. And it can go in different ways. One is it, you know, not admitting to yourself when there's a problem. And that, of course, leads to bigger problems down the line. And then when the bigger problems hit, then you start getting discouraged. And you take that evaluation and you turn it on yourself, which is not skillful. You have to have that ability to bounce back, even when the judgment is harsh. Make sure, though, that the judgment is not harsh on you, it's more harsh on what you're doing. Try to get you out of the picture as much as possible. Just enter into the action, enter into the activity here of trying to mold the mind into concentration. This works on many levels, just at the very beginning, just trying to stay with the breath. You may have been with the breath many times in the past and it worked out well, and today it's not working out so well. What do you do? You go back to the beginning. And a lot of people don't like that. It's very discouraging to keep finding yourself back at the beginning where you were before, but that's how you see things clearly. And it may be this time around, going back to the beginning, you'll see something that you've been missing as you've gone through the early stages. It's like some of the best books on Dharma are the ones that try to go back to what are the really basic parts of the Dharma. And John Lee has a nice passage where he says that a lot of people confuse high-level Dharma with low and low-level Dharma with high. 
In other words, the basics are where all the action is. It's like learning how to play the piano. There's a lot to be learned simply in playing your scales. And of course, everybody wants to jump past that to get to the real music, but a really cleanly played scale is something really nice and requires a lot of skill. And of course, you can transfer that skill to the music, but you have to be willing to go back and realize if the music's not going well, maybe you have to go back and do your scales again. And you're an important part of that. The practice of learning how to keep your spirits up. Realizing that everybody has setbacks. I've told you the story before about the, the woman I knew who went to study pottery with a living national treasure in Japan. And she was getting discouraged. She, she poured her pots into the kiln and they come out all misshapen and burned. Whereas his were coming out perfect every time, every time. Until one morning she came to the, the shed and his pots had been ruined. And he was there in the kiln trying to figure it out. And she realized that's what made him a living national treasure. Not that he was already perfect, but that he was always willing to learn. And he didn't take a setback as a personal affront or anything to be discouraged about. There's another lesson. It's when things aren't going well, and you look at the passages in the canon where the, the ideal meditator goes from this on to the next one, to the next one, and then gains awakening. It all seems very neat and orderly. And then you look at your practice, and it seems to be wandering all over the place, and sometimes getting worse than it was before you even practiced. That's when you've got to realize that the mind is very complex. It's a lot more complex than pottery. And there'll be things that are going to come up that may not have come up before, or you've been able to get past them, but this time they got you. Okay, you take this as a lesson to learn. And always stick with that resolve that you want to learn how to do this skillfully. And part of the skill is bringing the right attitude toward your mistakes. This is why the Buddha made this part of his lesson to Rahula at the very beginning of the practice. He told him, you try not to make mistakes, you try not to do anything harmful. But if you do, this is what you do. If you admit to yourself you made a mistake, go talk it over with someone who's more advanced on the practice to get some tips from that person. This way you learn how to be a more reliable observer of yourself, and you're willing to be quite open about the fact that okay, there are mistakes. You're not too proud to, to want to learn, because it's your pride that's the problem here. When there's a setback, that's, that's what gets wounded, is your pride. So learn how not to identify with your pride. And this is where it gets tricky, because sometimes that what's, that's what keeps you going, what keeps you motivated, since it, you want to do this well. You want to develop a skill that you can take pride in. But the best thing to take pride in is, if you're going to be really skillful, take pride in the fact that you're always willing to learn from a mistake, to admit a mistake, then it becomes necessary, because otherwise you can't learn from it. And when the mistakes seem huge and your mind is just going for days and days when it doesn't want to settle down, just don't give up. Remember, there's lots of things to develop here, not just concentration. There's a whole range of bottomies, a whole range of perfections. And sometimes you simply have to work on the perfection of endurance, the perfection of persistence or right effort, you know, generating desire, upholding your intent, activating your persistence. These are skills of attitude, and they're as crucial as anything else in developing the mind.
And remember, we're working on a duty here. And John Chai has a nice passage where he says, when the meditation is going well, you do it because it's your duty. When it's not going well, you still try to do it because it's your duty. Now, these d duties aren't imposed by anyone, aside from the fact that the fact of suffering is what imposes them, and the fact that this is the only way out. In the mind's sense of its duties. In some schools of psychology, it's called your superego. And in a lot of cultures, the superego can be pretty punitive. It sets up extremely high standards without regard to whether you can actually live up to them or not. And the standards seem to have very little to do with whether fulfilling them is actually going to make you happy. But the Buddhist superego is very humane. It's there for the purpose of your true happiness, to help you in your search for a way out of suffering, to help end your bewilderment. This is what you got to do. And the trick with any duty is to learn how to make yourself want to do it. There's a German poet, Schiller, who had a nice distinction. He said there are times when you have a sense of your duty and it's easy to do. That's called grace. Other times you have a sense of your duty and it's hard. There's something inside you just can't do it or gets in the way. And he says your ability to get yourself to do what you know you should be doing, that's dignity. Just try to bring some dignity to your practice. It's different from pride. And as we sort through all the ups and downs of our practice, learning that distinction is a really important skill.